Today we're going to talk about effective strategies in resolving complex construction disputes. My name is Ernest Brown. I've been at this about four decades as a civil engineer, project manager, and lawyer, resolving construction disputes in the United States and internationally. I've resolved about 3,000 disputes at this point in my career, and I hope that this brief description of the strategies that I've found effective that parties have used will be helpful to you. To begin with, why is the construction industry so contentious and so difficult? Bob Fleur, who I worked for back in the 80s, used to say that construction was in a constant state of confrontation. And it is in many respects, and there's some reasons for that. The first one is, it's so large. The public construction market in the United States in 2017 was $279 billion. The private construction industry in the United States during that period was $950 billion. So we're well over a trillion dollars in construction in the United States. So it's an enormous industry involving almost 7 million workers. But beyond that, projects are startups. What do I mean by that? If you were a Ford Motor Company and you spent the better part of two or three years designing and building one car and that was your product, what would you expect the outcome to be? Well, Ford Motor would say, no, we're going to build a few hundred of those and we're going to refine them and then we're going to build a few hundred more and then we're going to build several million of them and over several generations of that vehicle will probably perfect it into a great car for the American public. Not so with the construction industry. We have one shot. We build on a vacant piece of land or on perhaps across the river one product and it has to be right. Beyond that, there are multiple parties often dozens of major parties involved, that have never worked together before as a team. It's like fielding a Super Bowl team the week before the Super Bowl when none of your players have ever played before. Obviously, that's a daunting task. In addition, there are hundreds of contracts with varying scopes of work and compensation terms. For example, the architects and engineers may be billing by the hour. The suppliers might be billing off of a price list. On the other hand, the subcontractors and the general contractor may have a lump sum, perhaps some unit prices. So it's a complicated pricing structure that has to be administered. And then the money flows, which is often called the lifeblood of construction, can be impeded many, many locations. So, Here's a payment that comes to the general contractor. Before it gets to the person that may actually be supplying uh, some steel or some cabinets for a project, it may have to go through four or five different hands before the person receives it. And that takes time. And mistakes can be made or people in the middle may not have money at that point so that the payments don't get the people who deserve them. So there's lots of those sorts of problems that occur. It is also a, an industry that's awash in an ocean of paperwork. Now, these days it's mostly electronic, but there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of documents associated with a large project. Many of the projects I've worked on are between 100 million and 1.3 billion recently, and as large as 3.4 billion uh, for a project in Saudi Arabia that I was the uh, division counsel for in the 80s. These are huge projects and it takes a long time to find the information that you need. So if you have a dispute, just finding the information, the drawings, the models, the data, um, it's very, very tough. And even if it's electronic, getting through it is, is a, a task that may take weeks to do. And also we have a lot of technical issues. Now we have obviously construction and engineering issues and we have uh, design issues. We have um, scheduling issues that we have to work out. 
and often more exotic topics like metallurgy or electrochemistry or electronics or software development or hardware development that all go into these projects. And many of these projects are so big, they have never been done before. They've never been done at the same scale. They may be being done at multiple units, uh, multiple sets of buildings at the same time. And they may be using technology that is on the bleeding edge of the particular technical endeavor that we're talking about. So we're talking about prototypes using technology that's never been tried before on projects that may be hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars with a bunch of people that have never worked before. So as we say, what could go wrong? One of the main things I want you to get out of this discussion is that the costs rise sharply as the dispute progresses in time. In essence, the sooner that you can resolve a dispute, the less time you're going to waste. And I'll add one more thing. A dispute on a construction project can distract people from the teamwork that they need to build the project with quality, efficiency, in a timely manner, and most importantly, safety. If the project participants have a big financial issue in the middle of the job, they're not going to work as well together. They're not going to be keeping their eye on things that are important, and it may jeopardize workers' lives. So it's very important that people bring people in to the table and negotiate or bring in professional facilitators or mediators to be able to resolve these disputes early. Let me show you a chart that describes what I'm talking about. This is a construction alternative dispute cost chart. And it's pretty simple. On the far left hand side, you have negotiation. In negotiation, the parties have the most control over the outcome that they will ever have. If they don't like the outcome, they can say no. If they don't like the outcome very much, they can say, okay, maybe all right, I'll do it. Uh, if they like the outcome a lot, obviously they can, they can get that in hand now and get paid for it now. And it's relatively cheap. At the far end is a court or trial before a jury, which may be three or four or five years later and may be enormously expensive because not only do you have to train all the lawyers on what happened in the case and all the expert witnesses, but now you have to train an educated judge or jury and both sides are going to try to give them their view. So they're basically teaching two different versions of what happened. And the jury or the judge have to try to sort it out. It's enormously expensive. Construction litigation can easily cost 10 to 50 to 100 million dollars in costs. Construction litigation can often cost as much or more than the amount in dispute because it's so technical and it takes so long to get the documents together. So again, we will walk through these processes, but I want to highlight for you some of the main milestones. Negotiation, dispute resolution board, mediation, arbitration, special master, settlement conference, and court trial. Those are the usual highlights that you see in a construction dispute. And as you move from left to right in this chart, it gets more and more expensive, often at an accelerating rate. Now, a dispute that's not resolved by negotiation may progress rather rapidly to filing a complaint in court or an arbitration demand. Sometimes that's done just to get the other side's attention. Sometimes it's done because there's an upcoming filing deadline and parties have no choice. Sometimes those can be extended by mutual written agreement. Sometimes they can't. When you do do that, though, there are some really important things you need to remember. When you file this thing, you can't go back and unring the bell. It's very difficult. You can amend it, but whatever you said in that original pleading will be there forever. So don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, find counsel that knows how to do this, who've done this before, and they can use uh, documents and pleading forms uh, that uh, have been proven to be successful uh, in the past. Do a conflicts check. Make sure your lawyer knows who the parties are in the case so that they don't get conflicted out later in the case. Uh, Pre-filing requirements, sometimes you have to do certain things per the contract. Maybe it's a mediation, uh, maybe it's a meet and confer, 
there may be requirements to file a government claim uh, that have to be done beforehand. And these, type, these things may take a tremendous amount of time to get them done. A detailed investigation is required under Rule 11 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure in the United States. Uh, lawyers are bound to do a investigation so that they have a good faith belief that the facts and the contentions that they're making in the case are, are being made uh, fairly and in good faith. And so if they don't, they can be sanctioned and the parties can find themselves uh, with uh, contentions that are ill-founded and they can lose credibility, not only in the eyes of uh, the court, but in the opposing party and uh, experts and everybody else. So it's important to do an investigation as quickly as you can to make sure you've got the facts that you need. Be aware of timelines for notices, claims, when you file your lawsuit or your arbitration. Those deadlines are missed. You may waive the entire complaint and uh, be denied any recovery at all. Think about your venue and your contract clauses. Sometimes you think, boy, it'd be great to be in a particular hometown area or a state that you like or a city you like. But the law in that particular jurisdiction, that state, might not be favorable to your position. You might find that um, the contract governs that, but sometimes you have some ability to determine where the case is filed, whether it's going to be arbitrated or not. You can fight whether it's an arbitration clause, that it can be enforced, um, and you may find that uh, you have more flexibility than you think. Uh, know the rules that apply, certainly. Uh, filing a uh, American arbitration arbitration demand or a complaint in state and federal court without knowing the rules of those courts or those proceedings uh, can be fatal. So um, it's something where, again, we, we encourage the use of lawyers' experience in this business to be able to shape those and uh, file uh, those arbitration or um, court filings so that they're effective and comply with local rules. With regard to uh, local rules, those are usually those of the, the court itself. Um, but there's also local, local rules which may be pertinent to the particular judge in your case, uh, how they like to see cases developed and, and uh, tried in their courtrooms. And again, the rule in, in the firms that I've uh, managed lawyers has always been to file anything significant at least four weeks early. The rule uh, is based on the belief that, uh, especially in federal court, you may have the court clerk reject your filing three or four times before it's accepted on technical grounds, or uh, the fees may not be paid in a timely fashion. And if you miss those deadlines, again, you may waive your ability to uh, proceed and the lawyers have a big problem if they've um, dragged their feet and not filed something on time. Discovery. Most of the money in construction litigation is spent on discovery. Part of the reason for that is almost none of these cases are actually tried. In federal court, for civil cases, there are only about 1.2% of all those cases that are tried. It's a national statistic. So that means that 98.8% of these cases are settled sometime from when they were initially filed prior to the actual trial itself. So discovery is where the money is spent and it can be enormously expensive. You're educating the lawyers, uh, you're educating the judge uh, and others about a construction case, a construction project that's been done and over for three or four or five years. And to be able to gather the evidence to really show what happened is an excruciatingly expensive process. It includes getting the contracts, correspondence, plans and specifications, schedules, uh, updated schedules, e-discovery, which is mostly what it is now, uh, through emails, attachments, financial data, spreadsheets, um, project management programs, project websites, text messages, um, and other types of social media. In addition, we're intensely interested in photography, video, webcams, and drones to allow us to understand the project, and if we're lucky, to have time lapse or key photographs of uh, hinge, uh, hinge points in the project that we want to examine. And uh, unfortunately, sometimes, the moments before and the moments after a substantial and catastrophic accident, having just a few photographs can make a huge difference. It's also a third party discovery. Of course, that means the suppliers and the architects, the engineers, if they're not already in the case, but it also mean some government agencies like the Contractors License Board, 
where a party might say, hmm, maybe uh, my opponent doesn't have a valid contractor's license, or maybe it lapsed during the course of the project. Well, the source of that would be the contractor's license board. And of course, uh, that's something that usually a contractor's counsel is going to be very interested in confirming prior to uh, taking the case and certainly before filing a lawsuit. Finally, depositions and written discovery is extremely expensive and takes a lot of time. Deposition, basically taking uh, oral testimony under oath, recorded by a court reporter from a witness who's trying to remember things from three or four or five years earlier. And obviously showing them documents helps, but uh, it is important to hear their story. Written discovery, I've found, is used a lot. Usually production of documents is one that's effective, but uh, seeking the other side's contentions through um, interrogatories or requests for admissions, I've found is sort of a waste of time because people answer in a very uh, uh, evasive manner in many cases, or, and it takes a lot of time and money to try to get answers that mean anything. So again, uh, usually getting the other side's documents, taking the depositions of the key people, um, it's with the uh, uh, most productive source of discovery I've found in my years of practice. Now, using documents and depositions is an art. And it depends on the type of deposition, how you use documents. Um, is it a records deposition where you're just trying to get the scope of the universe of the, of the documents that may be in the other side's possession? Is it a person most knowledgeable or PMK deposition? where you're trying to discover what uh, the company believes their contentions are and the factual basis of those contentions, or an expert deposition where you're playing perhaps an expert chess competition with an opponent uh, who is the expert, or playing a world-class tennis uh, tournament with a Jimmy Connors or um, Agassi or other highly skilled player on the other side who knows the game who knows questions and answers and knows the effect of certain um, questions and answers on judges and juries. So uh, it depends on what you're doing, how you use documents. The other thing is, is it a discovery uh, device? Are you trying to actually get information from the other side? Are you truly seeking uh, truth? And in many cases where I'm an arbitrator, I find that really what they're trying to do is uh, embarrass the other side or uh, use um, the uh, discovery process and the deposition is an impeachment device, not only to find testimony that's contradictory, but to um, undermine the credibility of the witness and their, and their moral trustworthiness, if you will. So there are a lot of reasons that people uh, use documents and depositions. Um, sometimes they say we get the oral recollection first and then we'll show them the documents and show them how bad their oral recollection is. Sometimes they uh, try to coach them on a document that may be misleading in a sense if you look at it in isolation. So again, uh, there are a lot of games that are played in depositions and um, it's important for you to meet with counsel if you're in one of these cases to really understand the, so the sorts of uh, tricks and traps that may lie ahead of you in some of these deposition processes. Um, most trial lawyers will tell you that they want to save a few zingers for trial. They want to make sure that some of their best questions and some of their best evidence and documents they want to reserve for trial. And I understand that. Uh, but that's really an old school view. I understand it, but it's old school in the following way. Modern California discovery, particularly, and in federal rules throughout the United States, uh, has as its basis that if people ask you for what your contentions are and what your documents are, and you don't provide them, it's very likely you're not going to be able to bring them in court because you violated the spirit in the letter of the Discovery Act. So it's sort of use it or lose it. And you may have a great argument later on, maybe very subtle and so forth, but if it's really that great, why not offer it to the other side in mediation uh, early on or in negotiation and help resolve the case? So again, this idea of holding back all your information and not letting the other side know what your case is, they're gonna get it, but it's just gonna be through an expensive process of uh, discovery. So my view is, if you want to save some great question that you think is uh, the Perry Mason moment, okay, that's fine. But don't hide the ball on something important because the other side needs to know it if they're going to settle the case on the same number basis as, as you and your client think are appropriate. 
Selection and preparation of experts is hugely important. And what I like to do is show this chart, which shows the various roles of, um, of the parties and, and the court and the jury uh, in a trial. And then you can kind of understand how trial expert testimony fits into that. So the top boxes, you have a court judge, right? Uh, to the left, you have a court clerk, administration, bailiff is there to the bottom left in a courtroom. Uh, that's the one with the gun, typically. Um, and then the, the court impanels a jury. So where there is a jury, the court's role is to manage the process, so-called the procedure of the court, rule on objections for evidence, things of that sort, um, introduce what the case is about to the jury. And then the jury is the finder of fact. They're the ones who are going to judge the credibility of the witnesses. They're going to figure out what the damages should be. And as part of that, the plaintiff and the defense will both bring to court an expert witness. And the purpose of the expert witness is to help the jury and the judge understand better what the issues are in the case so that the jury and the court can make an informed and intelligent decision. An expert witness is not there to substitute their judgment or their opinion for that of the court. They're there to assist the trier of fact, jury, or the court in determining what is a fair and appropriate result. Where there's just the court, the judge, when there's no jury, then they're going to inform the court about that. When there's a jury, they're going to focus their attention on the, the jury and their understanding of the facts and the construction process and the technology that may be involved and the expert, maybe a metallurgist, it may be a variety of other types and fields, of structural engineering, scheduling of uh, construction accounting. But at the end of the day, that's what the expert witness is there for. Under the Federal Rules of Evidence 702, testimony by expert witnesses, uh, a witness who is qualified as an expert by knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education may testify in the form of an opinion or otherwise if the expert's scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge will help the trier of fact to understand the evidence or determine a fact and issue. Further, the rule says that the testimony has got to be based on sufficient facts or data, has to be the product of reliable principles and methods, and that the expert has reliably applied those principles and methods to the facts of the case. In other words, they've done their homework. Talk about graphics for a moment. Construction is a very visual uh, area of trial practice. If you do banking work, it's a lot of documents. And putting on the uh, foam board, a lot of blow-ups, or on a flat screen TV, words on a screen. Construction, we get to show some really cool pictures, and they can show the case. This is a picture from a case that I handled when I was a young lawyer, and it shows a big uh, scraper having rolled down the hill and destroyed these people's house. And I represented the homeowner on this. And I felt that one picture pretty much proved my case. And I, I think the, uh, the judge in the settlement conference agreed. But we only have those sorts of great pictures a few times in a career. Let me show you some good and some great trial graphics that may help uh, the experts get the case across. First one is a uh, artist rendering of a uh, $1.2 billion public-private partnership project in San Francisco, California. I was project counsel for this, and I like this because it showed overall that the project was going to redo the Presidio transit system from the Marina District in San Francisco all the way out to the Golden Gate Bridge. And that shows you, I think, quite a bit. But to really tell the judge, jury, arbitrator, uh, dispute re review board, um, in our case, what was happening, we had to show them something more specific. And so we used this chart, which showed uh, not only the original uh, bridges and, and arteries uh, through the Presidio to the bridge, 
but also what was going to be added, what was going to be deleted, and what was going to be modified. And this was an extremely helpful tool. The next one is, uh, a, if you will, a, a bridge, uh, which is a, a very unique tubular uh, framed structure that supports the Oakland Connector Project, which goes from the Coliseum State Station at BART in Alameda County, California, to the Oakland International Airport, about 3.1 miles. So these um, uh, twin um, uh, rail systems um, were the subject of about a $600 million project that I was counsel to. And this was a helpful picture to orient people in terms of the size of the car and uh, the structures and the superstructure that was uh, involved in building this project. I'll show you a much better picture though. This is of the signature bridge in San Francisco that uh, is a I-80. It uh, connects the Oakland area with uh, the city county of San Francisco. In fact, this particular um, landing place where the abutments are on this side of the bridge, on the left-hand side of this photograph, or this uh, rendering, I should say, uh, is Treasure Island. But see how much more graphical representation you can put on that chart uh, to show um, the structure of the um, tower and uh, how uh, the other uh, parts of the bridge, um, the Skyway, which was done actually by a different contractor um, that leads uh, farther to the uh, toll bridge uh, and the toll um, lanes, um, fits together to build the project as a whole. So again, a simple graphic, but gets people understanding the, the basic elements of that bridge. Now I'd like to talk to you about a few of the basic tools that we have for construction industry ADR. How do we get these cases solved earlier than spending three or four years uh, in trial and in discovery um, and tens of millions of dollars in legal expenses? Instead, how can we get this done as an industry sooner? The first one is partnering. We mentioned that on that early chart. Construction partnering is a formal process of working uh, with a facilitator to create a collaborative team and atmosphere to build relationships, reach common goals, and avoid disputes early in the project. Uh, the owner and the contractor jointly select a facilitator who's an individual. They share the costs of the facilitator, and the facilitator conducts meetings with key stakeholders, which may involve the contractor and the owner, but also the designers and others, and puts them in a room so that they can develop trust and respect for each other. Next, what is a DRB? A dispute re resolution board is a panel of impartial professionals, usually with a lot of experience, uh, formed at the beginning of the project to follow construction progress, encourage dispute avoidance, perhaps give some guidance about problems that they have seen with similar projects that could be avoided early, and assist in the resolution of disputes for the duration of the project. Typically, it's three impartial professionals with experience in construction and conflict resolution. The owner selects one member, contractor selects the other, and then those two DRB members select the chair. And I've been doing a lot of that. Uh, currently, I'm either the project neutral or a DRB member in about $3 billion worth of projects in the West Coast of the United States. And I found that it's a, a very collegial way for the parties to get together and sometimes surface issues that um, may be brewing, but um, they'd kind of like to discuss and, and, and get resolved. Um, members have to be approved by both the owner and the contractor, and then there's an agreement signed by all the parties and the members of the board. Uh, they review the contract and their charter uh, to see what they're supposed to do, their specific meeting times. They review contract documents, meetings, uh, held a project site with the owner and the contractor representatives, probably includes a site tour, which are a lot of fun, tremendously informative for the uh, uh, DRB members, and allow them to really understand what to do later on. And uh, there's usually an in-depth discussion in one of the job trailers of progress to date, design, issues, the schedule, any problems and potential disputes. Uh, and it acts sort of as a, as a way to um, have a if you will, some adults in the room who are a lot older, generally, than some of the younger project participants and who've seen how projects can go and, and maybe uh, 
of a bit of a, a broader, a longer view of um, of what uh, they need to do to to get along and to get the project finished um, on time safely. Litigation, of course, uh, litigation is. Uh, a difficult and, and lengthy process. We've talked a little bit about that. But one of the alternative dispute resolution processes that exists is the court special master. Special master is appointed by the court, but often at the suggestion of the parties, um, whose role is to coordinate discovery and conduct settlement conferences. And sometimes a special master can be appointed as what's called a referee in California and other jurisdictions where you actually take testimony and do findings of facts and conclusions of law for the um, judge to review. And if they agree, then uh, the court can issue that as a judgment. Uh, so there is some review and there is the possibility of, uh, of um, appeal of those uh, decisions. Um, mediation, of course, uh, is principally what I do in my career at this point. And, I do, do it throughout the U.S. Uh, in construction cases. It's where a third party, a mediator, is chosen to um, assist in communication and reviewing the project documents, uh, the briefs of both parties that are submitted uh, days or weeks in advance, understand the contracts at a deep level, uh, review expert reports, and then uh, have a series of, of meetings during the course of the day, both a joint meeting and independent meetings with the parties to be able to get them and move them towards a monetary settlement of the matter, which would be binding once they sign it. But again, the mediator is not making a decision. The mediator is facilitating a negotiation so that the parties can reach agreement. So they have a really retain control over their uh, dispute and the outcome of the dispute. Arbitration, on the other hand, will result in a binding decision by the arbitrator or the arbitration panel. Arbitration, is a formal process, much like a court proceeding, where the parties select an arbitrator, or sometimes three arbitrators. They schedule an arbitration hearing, attend the hearing to present evidence, and the arbitrator is obligated to make a decision called an arbitration award. It usually is um, at least showing um, a reasoned award, showing the reasons for the specific uh, claims and how they're either going to be agreed to uh, or denied, and then an evaluation of the damages in the case. Arbitration clause is very important to use an, an agreed industry standard because people who don't want to go to arbitration will attack a clause that's been sort of homemade. So uh, I found that the clauses uh, from the American Arbitration Association or uh, clauses from other national services like um, Judicial Arbitration Mediation Service and some others uh, are very helpful. They'll always say uh, that it's a binding arbitration. Um, it will say that it's going to be administered either by the parties or by the chair or by an association like the American Arbitration Association. It will state the number of arbitrators, usually one or three, and then the location, typically in the, in the venue where the uh, project was built. Although for international arbitrations, uh, you tend to find yourself in uh, Geneva or Paris or London or New York or Los Angeles as the major areas where that occurs. Um, but again, uh, discovery is allowable in, dis in arbitrations, but it, because it's by contract uh, and by rule, often the parties um, will find that they have a more restrictive amount of um, discovery they conduct as opposed to doing it in uh, state or federal court. Again, let's re revisit our chart um, and our principle that the sooner you resolve a case, the least expensive it is and the least time consuming. And beginning with uh, obviously uh, negotiation, so-called face-to-face negotiation, sometimes escalated to various uh, higher levels within the corresponding organizations, maybe going up to the project director within a public works agency or going up to the president of a construction company on the construction side uh, to try to get a resolution. Uh, partnering facilitation, again, the dispute review board, something that really is 
pretty inexpensive and is occurring during the course of the project so that uh, you may well have all of your decisions made by the time you get to the end of the project. Mediation, which can occur anytime uh, to use a facilitator to help you resolve the case. Um, arbitration, which is getting closer to a court trial and can be quite expensive. I just finished up a arbitration where I was the sole arbitrator and we had over 78 days of hearings. So again, arbitration can be long. Most of the hearings that I have are between five and 10 hearing days. And these can be substantial cases. One case was a $100 million case and we got it done in 10 days. Um, it was an unusual case with uh, incredibly prepared counsel and, and experts who knew that they had that uh, time period set by the CEOs of the two companies that had set up the uh, arbitration. Finally, the settlement conference and the court trial. Again, 98.8% of all of your civil disputes in federal court, and I will say also in arbitration, uh, you'll find are going to be resolved before you get to a trial. So be sure that you understand that the sooner you get it done, the better. And I'll finish with this. The bottom line is, if you actually have a trial, it is the result of a failed negotiation. It's not a epic battle um, uh, between two highly experienced construction lawyers that will determine the truth of the matter. What it often is, is a long, difficult, time-consuming, distracting, and uh, potentially catastrophic um, battle that can cost tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, in, in legal expenses and leave the parties to the mercy of a judge or the foreman of a jury who may see it a little bit differently and uh, end up with a result they don't expect. Most importantly, the longer it takes, the more it costs. So again, these are effective strategies you may employ and as a mediator, I will always suggest hire a mediator early. It's worth every penny you spend.